And today on the Vintage Vibe, something a little bit different. We're going to do a review of something that's really not quite in that golden age of vintage audio. 1980s instead, Technique's SUV 660. Something very obtainable to many at the time. And like normal, we're going to spend some time to talk about the unit, discuss some of the quirks, particularly when servicing, the features, and discuss how it actually sounds, and whether or not it deserves a place in your vintage audio collection. Ah, techniques. Now that's a brand that I could drink to. <sighs> Seriously though. If you were around in the 70s and the 80s, and you had ever been in an audio store, I mean, how could you not know the Techniques brand? I mean, the iconic, you know, big sweeping needles on the SEA 3 and 5 amplifiers, they were hypnotizing. I mean, every kid wanted one. And turntables, don't even get me going with the SL1200. I mean, it's probably the most iconic turntable of all time. Techniques, that's a name that's been around for a long time, one of Japan's biggest, yeah, they've had their ups and downs like any brand has. And today, the new Techniques brand, and I've had one of their integrateds and their uh, their speakers. They're they're fascinating. They're they're fantastic. They're second to none. But that doesn't always mean that all Techniques amplifiers were created equal. So let's talk a little bit about this Techniques amplifier, the SUV 660. When I first seen a 660, I was in Toronto. I was about 13 years old, and interestingly enough, Techniques was my very first amplifier I owned. I had a little V78, I think it was called, or a 98, kind of cheap plastic. It did have that same kind of, um, kind of clad plastic face on it, but it was definitely of lesser quality than this unit here. So one of the things that caught my attention, as trivial as it would sound, was up front and center the large volume knob. Now, what was so special about it? Well, it was just the fact that it wasn't made out of cheap plastic. In fact, the volume knob as well as the tone, um, treble, balance, and input selectors are all made out of metal. And in the 80s, if you remember the 80s, everything was plastic. So this kind of screamed quality to a kid, um, really to anybody in the audio hobby at the time. And when you look down in uh, the top of the unit, you had this OFC transformer, which was really, it stood for um, oxygen-free copper, really a Techniques marketing piece, but nonetheless cool. And uh, the large heat sinks were, you know, thick plated aluminum versus, you know, thin kind of uh, aluminum fins. And it weighed a ton. I mean, particularly as a kid, it felt like you were lifting up a truck. That, my friends, was cool. So it becomes one of the big questions all these years later when I could afford to buy one. I mean, who can't afford to buy one of these? 75, 100, 150 bucks, maybe 200 tops. The question is, is whether or not it was worth all these years of wait. And that is what we're gonna find out. So let's talk a little bit to start about what it was like to get this amplifier back up and running because if you're gonna buy used techniques, something like the SUV 660, you're probably gonna run into some of the same things that I did. So let's start with taking a peek inside. And here's a little close up inside the amplifier. So a nice close up inside of the Techniques amplifier, giving you an idea of what it kind of looks like. It's well laid out. It's not really um, filled with spaghetti, for lack of better words, for the wiring. It's neat, it's tidy. They use what they call a um, VC4 block construction system in it. Actually, a bunch of the Technics integrated amplifiers of the time, including, I think it was called the M100. Um, I've had one of those as well, too, was similar to this. The idea was to stiffen up the chassis to help reduce vibrations, improve fidelity. You can see, again, that heat sink in there, pretty decent. Um, the capacitor is modest, really not uh, a high-end capacitor in it, uh, like a Muse or something that you'd even find in Onkyo during that time period. So not badly constructed inside. We're going to take a little close-up of that transformer next. And for its power output, it's a decent little transformer. So inside there, you know, pretty well laid out, uh, nice and neat and clean. You don't have kind of wires all over the place or what we lovingly call spaghetti in the audio uh, hobby. 
it's it's kind of symmetrical, you know, the amplifier. Uh, it's not a dual mono or anything like that where you've got two transformers, but you do have that one large um, oxygen-free copper transformer. Again, whether that was a marketing piece or whether that really does make a difference, some argue oxygen-free copper will for purity. But inside the amplifier, you've got kind of a blocked construction. So Techniques at the time called it VC4, and that was four separate blocks. So the amplifier is broken up into blocks to stiffen up the chassis and thereby reduce vibrations. And the idea was improve fidelity. I think Sony at the time had something similar. They call it the Gibraltar chassis. Um, but all in all in there, there's not um, anything that's tremendously special. I mean, it's, it's well put together, but you don't even have like um, Onkyo at the time, the Integra would have Muse capacitors. I mean, aside from Technique's filter capacitors, which they called high-speed capacitors, now you gotta remember in the 80s, this was the time of the turbo. Everything was turbo, the turbo Trans Am. If you're a kid and you had a, an RC car, the turbo hopper. So maybe that's kind of where the high-speed capacitor comes from. I don't know if it really makes a difference, um, but hey, it's, it's kind of neat the nonetheless. So I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of the capacitors. The heat sinks up close, and then we're going to talk about a few other things when it comes to servicing the unit. And here's a close-up of those high-speed capacitors, as well as the heat sink, which is a nice cast aluminum. So being an amplifier from the 80s, um, you know what, it's probably due for a service. And if someone says it has been serviced, I bet you it hasn't. I mean, in fact, a lot of people who say they have serviced the amplifier, um, you know, take something like deoxid and they stick it in between the switches and they just kind of press the trigger psh, and spray all kinds of gunk in there and usually make a mess of things. Most people don't even know how to clean these. Now, the challenge with this amplifier when you go to get inside of it is just that, taking the faceplate off and getting inside of it. You have to be slow and methodical and look for all the screws in it. And the tone control board on this one where you're gonna clean the pots with a cleaner is actually attached to the face plate. So you can't just remove it and spray inside those pots. Um, so you gotta be very careful because the connections actually uh, connect from the inside circuits, the boards, to the board, the tone board on the face plate. And I'll show you a picture of that. Someone did me the favor of trying to clean and making a mess out of it and actually breaking one of the control boards where the power switch is. And uh, I was lucky they didn't break the tracing of the circuit, so I was able to use epoxy um, glue to put that back together. Now I was having the typical scratchy channels as well as um, channels dropping in and out, and from my experience that's usually a bad relay from oxidization, so I'll show you a couple of those pictures and then we'll talk about a few other things to look out for. This is the face lowered down to access the board, the power switch circuit board, as well as the main tone control board. So you could probably see that close up of that board that I had to repair the second picture. And you can see in the last picture, we got the board right out. So on the bottom of the board, there's almost like little white clips. And those clips uh, made up with the wires that come from the main control boards on the amplifier. And what basically you have to do is take a little screwdriver and the little white clips along the bottom, and there's three of them across it, you gently pry up the, the plastic clip and you can slide the contactors out and then the whole board comes away, the whole faceplate. And that's the proper way to clean it so you can work at it properly, unscrew it from the face place, uh, work each you know pot individually. If you try to clean it where it's all assembled, chances are you're going to put stress on those connectors again and break something. The last thing I had to do once I cleaned all that up and you'll probably have to do to address that dropping out channel is clean the relay. Now there's going to be two relays. They're kind of in between the transformer and the heat sink. You can't miss them, they're small black squares. If you just take a slotted screwdriver, you can pop the tops off them. And uh, when you turn the amplifier on, again, don't put your fingers near anything because you want to get electrocuted, you actually see the relay open and close. So you know where you have to clean. Take a business card, cut it in a thin strip about this wide, soak it in deoxid cleaner, gently rub that in between the contact points and that's all the friction you need to remove the oxidization and get the relay to start working again. Uh, some people will say use like an emery cloth or uh, more of a abrasive you know cleaner. I wouldn't because you're going to take the coating off that relay and it's going to cause it to oxidize twice as quickly and then the relay will be junk. Um, so let's go over a couple other things with the actual exterior of the amplifier and some of the features before we talk about how it sounds. 
So let's go over the front of the amplifier. There's not a lot to really go over. It's um, pretty straightforward. You see on the far right hand side actually the logoing for Techniques Class AA. Now if you recall, Techniques um, came out with something that they called New Class A. Basically that was a way to have a sliding bias as they call it. You could run the amplifier at low volume and basically the equivalent of Class A or awfully close to it for purity of sound. And once you need to turn it up, you know, because you had your 80s disco party going on, then it would switch into Class B and you get that full whopping 80 to 90 watts per channel. Something you're also going to notice here, on the right hand side, you've got a couple LED type lights. One which says current drive and the other one which says voltage drive. It's kind of like a warp drive on the USS Enterprise. A popular show in the 80s indeed. Um, <laughs> This was, with all seriousness though, a way to kind of monitor, not that you would do anything, but it would tell you that your amplifier was operating properly. Uh, the amplifier basically would detect whether there was any abnormalities in voltage and current, and if there was, it would shut itself down. So you've got on the amplifier your basic necessities, your input selector, CD's obviously on there. Uh, CD was kind of I mean, you had to have a CD player in the 80s. You also have the provision for DAT, D-A-T, um, digital analog tape or something like that, I think it was called. I can't remember anymore. I never had a DAT player, but DAT is there. Uh, you also have in the bottom um, provisions for moving magnet and moving coil. Again, turntables weren't quite out of the market yet. They're still there, and the phono stage in this I would presume to be fairly decent, although I haven't hooked it up yet. Um, it wasn't until a couple years later that phono stages became really obsolete. And our last feature to talk about before how it sounds, right beside the volume control, you've got a switch that says Power Amp Direct. It's kind of like pushing the button in James Bond's uh, Austin Martin eject button. When you push it, absolutely nothing happens except a red light turns on. Um, what actually will happen is on the back of the amplifier, uh, you've got your RCA inputs and one of them says Power Amp Direct. Now this is not a way to bypass the preamp and run it with a separate preamp, um, which you see you know, on some amplifiers, but what it does do, it allows you to separately input whatever favorite source you have, for example a CD player, directly to the power amp and still uh, be able to control the volume with the volume control on this. So that would be the only part in the circuit that would work, would be the gain controller, or the volume knob, bypassing everything including the tone controls and as well as the balance knob. Again for pure sound, and I will say listening to it, it did make a difference. You get a little bit more dynamic headroom I would call it, you know, where things just kind of sound uh, a little less congested, a little more airy, uh, because this amplifier at times can sound a little stale or congested. So I, I did think this did help. So, was the Techniques SUV660 worth the wait, you know, for, oh geez, over 30 years? Well, I did get a chance to try it out and uh, that's part of the fun of the hobby and uh, that kind of leads us to what you'd expect me to say is no it really wasn't worth the wait i mean the challenge or the, the problem with this is you know i really wanted to like it because i had built it up so much over the years but it really doesn't do anything tremendously well i mean if you want background music it'll do that but i mean my Onkyo, for example, the A927 has got a tremendous top end. I mean, it sparkles, it's almost uncanny, it's so clean, and I can appreciate that. And my Luxman, the L560, that's got a magical mid-range that makes you want to sit down and listen to a second and third record. This one, it doesn't have that either, it's just kind of flat and lifeless. And the NAD, the little amp that could, the 3020 that I reviewed not too long ago, I mean, that had a bottom end that would occasionally make you kind of just look up and stop and say, wow, did that just come from that amplifier? How is that even possible? The techniques really doesn't have that either. So 
I guess I'll never get back that $100, $150 I put into it in all that time. Nor will I get back the time I spent reviewing this thing. But at least, for you perhaps, it'll save you from making the wrong mistake. Because there's a lot of mistakes that we can't make and sometimes, well, it's just fun to make a mistake, but this is one of those mistakes that's not gonna be fun to make. So if I was you, I would save yourself, you know, the money and uh, it's a big nay to add to my vintage audio collection. But hey, thanks for joining us on the Vintage Vibe. We hope you join us next time. Take care. You know what? I'd feel a lot better if I had a little bit more of this.